Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Quentin Dempster, a has-been journalist. This webinar, under the auspices of the Centre for Public Integrity, a not-for-profit think tank, is entitled, What Does the Inspector's Report Mean for the NACC? The inspector in this case is Gail Furness SC. She received hundreds of complaints from the public after our brand new National Anti-Corruption Commission announced that there would be no public benefit or value in opening another investigation into what the media are now calling the RoboDebt 6. Six individuals, bureaucrats and politicians, names redacted, referred to the NACC by the RoboDebt Royal Commission. Needless to say, the anguish arising from that decision from those impacted by RoboDebt, now acknowledged as one of the most cruel and egregious Commonwealth government implementation failures, is still resonating throughout the polity. You can read the inspector's much anticipated report online and its key attachment on recusal and conflict of interest by Alan Robertson SC. But in the likely event you haven't read this material, we're going to take you to the key findings. To help us do this, we have three of the finest minds in the integrity movement, such as it is. So if you're joining us from the Qantas Chairman's Lounge as you wait for your flight upgrade, sit back, relax and enjoy this show. Please welcome the Honourable Michael Barker, KC. Michael was counsel assisting the WA Inc. Royal Commission and led the charge for Western Australia to form its own integrity commission. Hello, Michael. Hi, Quentin. Lovely to be here. Uh, we're joined by Associate Professor Will Partlett. Will is the Centre's resident anti-corruption commission expert and Stephen Charles Fellow. Will's research at the centre focuses on the evolution and role of integrity commissions in Australia. And we did a, a, a webinar with Will uh, exclusively just recently, which you can see online. Hello, Will. Hi, Quentin. Good to be here. And the Honourable Dr. Margaret White AO. Margaret is a barrister or a former appeals court judge and the former deputy chancellor of the University of Queensland. Hello, Margaret. Good afternoon, Dempster. Quentin. I'll answer to anything. <laughs> Michael, you've read Gail Furness's findings, which relies largely on the opinion of Alan Robertson about NACC Commissioner Paul Brereton's mistake in judgment, as it's been called. Take us briefly to Robertson's evidence he uses to substantiate that embarrassing finding. Well, it, it's first, as most of the people who are listening to uh, and participating in this webinar will know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a perception of bias case, not actual bias. And the complaints by everybody who immediately wrote into Gail, uh, Furness, the inspector, is to say, uh, how could he uh, remain involved to some extent in this decision, having said he had a conflict of interest? And it was uh, that question that uh, the inspector referred to my old colleague on the federal court, uh, Alan Robertson, for his for his advice. And you can uh, see the factual circumstances set out in the inspector's report and also in Alan Robertson's report. But it, it basically goes like this. The, the, the knack is set up. There's a lot of agitation, as you've said, uh, and an expectation that, uh, that the NAC will take on and inquire into the robo-debt matter and particularly the half dozen, the six people who were the subject of a sealed report from Commissioner Catherine Holmes. Uh, their names hadn't been disclosed to us. I think two of them have become uh, clearer in recent times as a result of the Public Service Commission inquiry. Uh, and so then the facts start to come out. Uh, the, uh, the Commissioner uh, understood that this sealed uh, inquiry was going to be uh, sent to him. On the 3rd of July last year, he, uh, he, he recorded uh, uh, one of his uh, conflict declarations. He said it was highly possible that he could be conflicted, as he knows, referred person one well. And if that person is the subject of a referral, then he would not be involved in decision making concerning that person. And then when the materials arrived at the NAC, and it was clear that that person was the subject of uh, the referral. Uh, on the 7th of July, the commissioner uh, confirmed in, a, in, a, in writing to his colleagues that uh, he had a conflict. Uh, and for that reason, the deputy commissioner, uh, Rose, would lead the commission on these referrals 
I will not be involved in any decisions concerning referred person one. However, I will retain an overall interest in the policy questions that arise concerning these referrals generally, because these questions, particularly the scope of corrupt conduct, will necessarily have ongoing ramifications for us. Then on the 11th, the declaration was made to the Attorney General. He was obliged under the, the Act to, to, to do that um, and confirmed that uh, he had has had or have a close association uh, with that person and would recuse himself. And then the next important one was when the, the NAC senior assessment panel uh, met on the 19th of October, uh, a little while later, and a fourth declaration was made on that occasion. And Alan Robertson looked at a number of documents, notes taken, minutes of that meeting, which uh, plainly indicated that the commissioner stayed in that meeting for a period and and engaged in some discussion about the matter there were, there were emails there are email trail to uh, uh michael weren't there that uh, that had to be surrendered up to uh gail furness and uh, alan robertson yeah look it, things were happening i mean this is all very new in the nap they uh, they they know they're going to have to deal with the question of just who's caught by uh, corrupt conduct uh, what sorts of public officials can be caught and at the extent of uh, the sort of conduct that might be the subject of a corruption inquiry. For example... They, they like call we, it triage. Well, they, tr they triage it. You know, you go into the hospital with a sore arm, they have a look at it and they decide what sort of service you might need. So they look at it and, and, and the ultimate outcome is the Deputy Commissioner finds that uh, they shouldn't take this inquiry on and, and it ultimately comes out in the reasons... For the uh, for the decision that's made uh, as to why not, and that includes the fact that there's been uh, you know a deep inquiry into these things at the Royal Commission before Commissioner Holmes, that the matters are probably going to the, the Public Sector Service Commission and they'll deal with it, uh, and that in any event, what sorts of remedies could we the NAC be able to provide if 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 there were findings made against these people and. And all of these issues were, were actually initially raised by the Commissioner back in July at the senior officers meeting, and they all find themselves expressed in the ultimate decision of the Commission after the decisions apparently made by uh, Deputy Commissioner Rose. Uh, I'll say apparently, well, plainly made, it, it was not signed. But the question was about form and substance and what the reasonable third party uh, bystander would 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 think, and that's that's the crux of the of the matter, and and that's where Alan Robinson had had no doubt about the reasonable apprehension of of partiality when he when he came and and, and looked at the matter. Yeah. Margaret, Margaret, what did you make uh, of uh, Robertson? Uh, it, it went to the uh, Brereton's claim that he'd recused himself. He'd passed on the uh, the decision-making on not to proceed with the robo-debt referral uh, to the Deputy Commissioner, but Robertson seemed to find evidence that he was all over it. Indeed he did. Look, uh, Alan Robinson um, did what all courts reviewing uh, cases of this kind of conflicts do, uh, and uh, he went minutely through all the evidence and he gave particular weight to what happened before and during the decision-making process. He gave very little weight to what unkind people might call the exculpatory media statement that followed the decision or indeed the submissions that were made uh, to the inspector. And, and of course, as you know, one or two things might not matter, but when you look at the accumulation of facts here, uh, Alan Robinson didn't dither a bit. He he applied the well-known test. It wasn't whether the deputy uh, commissioner herself was very experienced and knew about things. That was absolutely applying the wrong test. He was totally orthodox in his approach. He dealt with the test that Michael has mentioned. It's the perception of a third-party observer knowing the facts and behaving reasonably. Um, can well, I can I just? Judges know about uh, conflict of interest. Uh, how did you handle it, uh, Your Honour, Margaret? <laughs> well, it's not how I handled it particularly that matters. It's how 
we all know how we should handle it and most of us did our best to apply it that way. A conflict arises, it depends on the nature of the conflict and the circumstances. In some circumstances, and the example that is given often enough is in a club, a conflict of knowing somebody, social setting doesn't matter much at all. Uh, in a court, you just play it out, you see what the conflict is and you make a decision. If it's a real conflict, then you manage it. And it mostly means you get out of the case altogether because there's no other way of managing it. Managing it. Uh, now, uh, Commissioner Brereton has been a judge for a very long time, nearly 20 years. I find it astonishing that his management of this was the way he dealt with it because when these cases come up, I can tell you that the, the judges are all over them. They love reading about how their colleagues may or may not have stuffed up on this one. Uh, and so so uh, he was a very senior judge and that it is mystifying, I think, to most judges how this could have happened. But I, I suppose uh, uh, what I'm concerned about is that uh, he's the brand new uh, commissioner of the National Anti-Corruption Commission and he, he had... Uh, uh, a great concern about how it uh, presented itself and um, that was why he was all over the uh, the press release and trying to handle uh, his what he saw as was a particularity in his conflict by knowing one particular person but uh, michael it, it goes robertson goes further doesn't he that uh, uh, that is there any evidence that he influenced uh, the outcome it's not that sort of case, as Margaret's uh, reiterated. This is this is the perception. Uh, is there a perception that uh, the, the person in question was too close to what was happening? And 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 you know, Alan Robertson ultimately wraps it up in a in a passage that uh, um, that the inspector repeated word for word. The commissioner's involvement in the decision-making under Section 41 was comprehensive before, during and after the 19 October 23 meeting at which the substantive decision was made. And, it, and, you, and you just have to go through it. The views of the commissioner expressed at the meeting of 19 October 23 were not limited to policy questions concerning the referrals generally, as the policy questions had a strong factual element specific to, amongst other things, referred person one. The discussion was framed by the issues raised by the Commissioner. The Commissioner settled the minutes of the 19th of October 23 meeting. The Minister, the, the, the complaint of Valor Robertson was in his report that, that he was engaged in that discussion about the important factors that were going to drive an outcome. So instead of just saying, I've got a conflict here, I know this person, I have a close association, and walking out of the room and staying out of the room, having nothing to do with it, the Commissioner stayed there. So that's that's not a question of actually having made the decision because he wasn't in the room when it was made, but he had that degree of apparent influence. Thanks. I'll get to that. Will, uh, uh, were you surprised that the National Anti-Corruption Commission Inspector, Gail Furness, has had the temerity to bounce the Commissioner? Uh, Attorney General Dreyfus's original NAC legislation covering the role of the inspector as an external oversight of uh, this anti-corruption body was amended after agitation by the crossbench in the Senate. Was that crucial to empowering the inspector, do you think? Well, I mean, the, the first thing to say is that you can see in the amendments proposed by the Greens, the actual definition of officer misconduct that that was found in this report. So it is, I think it was important, the amendments made by the crossbench. And given everything that, that Margaret and Michael just said, I don't think it's a surprise at all that she made this finding. In fact, it's relatively straightforward once you see the facts laid out in front of you that he engaged in um, a number of actions that would lead any objective third party to think reasonably that he could have influenced the outcome of this decision, even though he didn't he didn't make it himself. So. Yeah, I think it it the the uh, amendments did make a difference, uh, in, at least in, in some small way. But really, what we're seeing here is a it's a serious lapse of judgment on a, on an extremely high profile decision, right? I mean, the NAC's decision about whether to take on these six individuals referred by the Royal Commission, or in just in general to look into robo debt, is a hugely politically charged issue um, for the for the NAC to be considering and for the 
for this type of actions to take place is is truly remarkable. And so I, in that regard, I don't see it at all surprising or, um, you know, it's this, the NAC inspector played the role that she was meant to play. Well, this is going to go down in the history books of uh, what you call the uh, uh, the integrity movement in Australia. Mm -hmm. Will I'm going to uh, fire some questions at uh, at you, but please feel free to uh, cut across each other if you need to to make a point. Uh, just briefly, what is meant by mistake of law or fact in this context? I think Michael's covered it to some extent. A mistake, uh, um, and it, it goes to the future of the National Anti-Corruption Commission if this is just a mistake or a, a, a lapse in judgment. Uh, it seems to me a fair-minded observer to be Jesuitically vague. Paul Brereton was not subjected to what Janet Albrechtson declares to be the engine room of truth, which is the, the cross-examination on his motivations, which may have caused this now. He's admitted it. It was now an admitted mistake. Uh, Margaret, you. It is a pity about that word. It's in the legislation, though, uh, Quentin, and it, and it does tend to, to diminish the seriousness of it. Um, and in a sense, that's a little unfortunate, but it was the only slot, really, where this fitted. Um, and so what it really means is that the commissioner uh, either misconceived in law the test that he had to apply to manage the conflict just announcing the conflict is insufficient. So he either mistook in law what he needed to do or or uh, the factual basis of the management was deeply flawed. So it's one or the other, and, and they'd probably play in together. That, that's really what that means. But in order to, re to describe it as um, an error of judgment or a serious lap, of judgment, which some of our captains of industry seem to be flowing, throwing around a bit lately, tends to say, oh, well, look, anyone could have made this mistake. But the commissioner, um, in, in the uh, explanation that uh, the media statement says, well, we all make mistakes, judges make mistakes all the time. This is not that kind of case. Can I just emphasise that? This is not like hearing a case making some wrong findings of fact, which the appeal court says you shouldn't have found or that you misconceived the law. This is much more fundamental than that. This goes to the heart of the natural justice process. It is so serious and so essential, you cannot minimise it in the way in which I think there's been an attempt to do. Um, yes, and I, I'd, I'd urge everybody to look at uh, Paul Brereton's uh, statement that he put out in response to the inspector's uh, report. Uh, Michael, what did you make of that? Because he gives, uh, as Margaret said, that, that it was a, a mistake. Uh, uh, we're subject to appeal, and I've been uh, I've been reversed on appeal uh, on procedural and other technical matters. What did you make of, uh, of Paul Brereton's uh, response? Well, I read it with with interest. Quentin, um, I wondered what his response to the, uh, the findings would be. Um, they're points that can appropriately be made, but uh, uh, I generally agree with what Margaret said. We're dealing with this brand new organisation that we've had to fight very hard for, the Centre for Public Integrity, of which Margaret and I are, uh, are new directors, uh, was very much involved in, in pushing for the NAC to be created and the amendments to be made. And we want to see this working well off. Generally speaking, it seems to me that uh, that uh, Mr. Burton's uh, response is, is, is a little defensive. Some of the points made, I think, are actually dealt with by Ellen Robertson and discounted in, in his reasons. Uh, it's a really important test. I mean, actual bias is one thing, and it's pretty terrible. Um, most of the bias cases that involve judicial officers or tribunal members and the like are the perception of bias case. And, and for this to happen in the very first outing, more or less, of, of NAC is, is, is most unfortunate indeed. I'd just add so that those listening appreciate why we're talking about the perception of bias and the mistake of law or fact is because under the NAC Act, this is plainly a question of whether or not there was agency maladministration. The expression agency maladministration is a key expression in the Act. It's going to come up again in the future. And it's defined in various ways about 
was there unlawful conduct? And if there wasn't, amongst other other things, uh, 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 was it a decision that arises wholly or in part from a mistake of law or fact? Ellen Robertson had no hesitation in saying there's no unlawful conduct, but there was a mistake of law for the reasons that Margaret just gave. And he added, really, a footnote to his, if you read his judgment, if it's not that, then it's plainly uh, an error of fact. And you're driven to analyse it in terms of mistake of uh, law or fact because of the language in the statute, as Margaret's pointed out. So, look, it's it's it, 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 it's a it's a tough one. Um, you know, it's like putting a new batsman in the test cricket, I suppose, is the, the new Don Bradman who edges the first ball through to the keeper in the Boxing Day test, and, and, and that's the end of their career. But, uh, you know, hopefully everything can come back from this. Will? Yeah, just to just to, to build on, on Michael's point, I think the, the the actual legal terminology that really strikes me reading this is 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 what Michael mentioned, which is officer misconduct is type of conduct that if engaged in by the NAC itself would prove to be maladministration. And if we think of what the National Anti-Corruption Commission is meant to be doing in the first place is itself looking for maladministration in other parts of the of the of the governmental apparatus machinery of government. So it's particularly damaging and concerning when we see a finding like this made about uh, the leadership of, of the NAC. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think this is I think this can be come back from, but it, we're probably going to get to this at some stage. It really does raise the viability of uh, Commissioner Bre Brereton's status at the, as the as the, I think the commissioner himself, um, given this finding and given the perception more broadly that, that the public is now going to have about him and his leadership team, his deputy uh, commissioners at the at the NAC itself, because it's extremely important in these early early years that this NAC establish itself and establish its reputation as a guardian of the public trust, as pointed out thirty plus years ago in the WA Inc Royal Commission. Thanks. Uh, there's another point. Furness says she was not tasked to review the merits of the NACC decision not to investigate the referred individuals. Her findings rest entirely on the conflict of interest uh, issue involving the commissioner alone, not the deputy commissioners. So the inspector is there only to adjudicate on complaints about procedural fairness. And she had hundreds of complaints from the public. Uh, that's an acceptable limitation, is it, when the issue of independence is to be considered. So the, the independence of the National Anti-Corruption Commission so it can uh, get on with its important work is important. Will, can you answer that? Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely reasonable. I mean, the idea is the inspector looks into misconduct by officers within the NAC and whether they're acting with, you know, in, in, the, in line with the principles of natural justice and so forth. Uh, but the actual merits of any judgment when they're triaging a decision about something is, is, is up to the commissioner and, and, the, and those around him or her in their decision making process. And I think that's so it's, it's reasonable. You don't want an inspector to have too much. You don't want an inspector to become a kind of appeals court from the, the NAC's decision making process. But you do want the inspector to ensure that things are working well within the structure and the procedures that are taking place about decision making. And of course, that's what she's found here. Now, in fairness, in fairness to Paul Burton, I know uh, many critics of these investigative anti corruption bodies now operating in the states and territories of our mighty nation, complain that they can be turned into political show trial. That seems to be uh, the arguments uh, against the existence of these uh, powerful bodies. Are uh, any of you prepared to assert here in this webinar that Paul Brereton and the NACC had more than sufficient evidence to take up the robo-debt Royal Commission referral? Because the public hasn't seen uh, the nature of that referral uh, uh, we, we know the context, of course, but not the specific nature. Were there lines of inquiry in those redacted six names that uh, uh, that a reasonable person could have expected the NACC to go? Because the, the has accepted the mistake in judgment and has accepted the recommendation from uh, the inspector that a, an, an eminent person be appointed to review. And this is any robo-debt uh, people, people involved in the robo debt uh, scandal are, uh, who are watching. That's what they want to know. The the were there uh, ways that was the merit of the um, 
were there merits and justification for pursuing what I call the Robo Debt Six? Uh, Margaret. Well, the legal, the internal legal advice, which is uh, laid out in Helen Robinson's um, uh, report, suggests that they thought there were uh, good, good uh, grounds. They said, look, there were some interesting issues to raise, which were a bit novel. That is, they were locked into some what I would call a fairly old fashioned no notion of personal benefit that someone gave them a brown paper bag. But there are all sorts of other um, uh, things that, and of course, the breach of, of public trust was there with neon lights all around it. Um, it, it seemed to me that that there was plenty. The other thing that that oh, sorry, just to interrupt, just to interrupt. I, I read that in this material that the uh, the Australian Public Service Commissioner uh, on disciplinary grounds could could and has in fact gone into that detail. So Barrett and May well have said, well, look, they, they they can be disciplined and held to account that way. The public concern now is the accountability. Uh, which arises from uh, this uh, this referral, isn't the NAC defence defence uh, plausible on the basis that the Public Service Commissioner uh, has disciplinary powers that are more appropriate? And when you triage the evidence, it wasn't sub uh, substantial enough for them to go uh, into the definitions of corruption under the NAC Act. Well, the, 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 of course, there was a mistake of fact there. The Public Service Commissioner could only deal with public servants, and lots of them weren't, a number of them weren't. Uh, but the other thing was that, that the declaration of corrupt conduct, which is which is at the heart of what the NAC is doing here, they seem to misconceive their role with the greatest of respect. They seem to think that because they couldn't provide some kind of compensation or remedy to those who, who were injured by this huge breach of public trust, uh, therefore, there was no point in taking it up. That was at the heart of their reasons, in effect. No public value or benefit, yes. Yes, but they talk about remedy. The mere fact that you could declare conduct to be corrupt conduct is surely a pretty savage thing to say about any person who's worked in the public sector. And uh, it is also very good at, ex at defining it for the public. What message does it send to the people of Australia and to decent public servants, that this is not this is nothing to see here for us. Uh, to that, be that's in. that's the awful tragedy of this because it, in the pub test, as we vile journalists supply, uh, it uh, it doesn't seem to pass it. That it, it starts to look like a cover up, which is distressing uh, for all those interested in uh, in accountability. Michael, well, one of the big things from the very beginning, and why these sorts of bodies got set up. In, a, in Australia, New South Wales was first Queensland, second Western Australia, third, and, and then they kept coming along. It was this notion that they're accountability agencies. They're there to assist parliaments exercise their overview of what happens in, in the in the executive. And it's and it's not all about crime, as, as Margaret said. It's not about discovering whether a brown paper package with something in it was handed at the, at the dead of night from one person to another. It's about good government. It's, it's about good government. This is what it's about. And the evidence that we all heard, just as citizens that came through the robo-debt inquiry, shocked many of us. And, and for a lot of people who, as Margaret said, intimated, were in the public sector, particularly at senior levels, but no doubt at junior levels, having gone to public sector school and learnt about, you know, you have to give fearless and honest advice to your minister, and that's a that's a heck of a challenge. And and for lawyers in the public sector, it's, it, I've admired them because they've got one of the toughest jobs in government, not to shirk the job. And yet we were worried from evidence we heard that that people had gilded the lily, or they and this was the point: had they given complete advice, or had they misled? Now they are really important questions. If the if the NAC were to take this on and start to look at the evidence that, that falls behind that, and we don't have it all, I don't have it all, then you might worry about some sort of systemic weakness in the Commonwealth Public Service. Has it been, for example, so politicised that we can't trust it anymore? And we live in a day when people don't trust politicians. You've mentioned robo debt, people flying on people's private aeroplanes. You know, you can get over going to the footy or to a concert, I suspect. But we, we, we're we not trusting politicians as much. 
And on top of that, we've got international politics, which we get in our news feeds every day. So, so there is something here really important, and it comes to the public trust. This issue is so important. Public trust, government is conducted on behalf of the people, and we have real expectations as to how it should be done. All right, I'll come to you in a sec, Will. It seems that there's consensus here that uh, on the evidence that's publicly available to uh, to you guys, that there was sufficient uh, grounds for them to triage, as they call it, uh, the robo-debt referral to an investigation on uh, systemic and uh, serious. Uh, but it, 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 does it go down to uh, the definition of corruption by comparison to maladministration? The NAC Act doesn't declare uh maladministration as a ground to uh, uh for public inquiry will so so the NAC act in section eight say, states that the the corrupt conduct is any conduct that is a breach of the public trust right so it is so that could include maladministration that can include misconduct and, so and that's again, the broadest, this all goes that's back the broadest to, grounds you're making that viewpoint that's the broadest grounds yeah incredibly broad right covers a, a, a vast range of things and i think I fully agree with, with Margaret's point. I, I think that the leadership under uh, Commissioner Brereton have, have an overly narrow misunderstanding of the role of this institution, and it's concerning, I think. Um, and But, you know, to, to what Michael's saying, you know, the, the work that Michael and, and Paul Finn did on the WA Royal Commission is, is I think, foundational in this idea, which is what, what's called, what, they, what they call the trust principle in the Royal Commission. The trust principle is critical to the functioning of our democratic system. Uh, when we see a trust principle break down, like in the United States, we, we see how problematic that is for any form of democratic government. Um, and it is critically important that this be protected. And I think by any, you know, I think sometimes we can get a little bit too caught up in the details of these six individuals, blah, blah, blah. I mean, the Na National Anti-Corruption Commission should have been investigating broadly what happened with the robo-debt scheme. How did this happen? And then engage in what, you know, the, the New South Wales ICAC... We just had a Royal Commission. Well, we just had a Royal Commission in derive that. Yeah, but the National Anti-Corruption Commission has significantly more powers to look into and significantly more weight in terms, I think, in terms of because of its, its title as a National Anti-Corruption Commission, to provide... Um, recommendations about what is a culture of deeply problematic um, interactions between public servants and elected officials and so forth that lead to the kinds of unlawful and and sometimes just unethical behavior that we saw in this scheme, because otherwise it will happen again. Um, and, you know, very much you see that in the second reading speech of the New South Wales ICAC. It, this was described as a corruption prevention agency. Um, and I think that the NAC, obviously, with with Robodet, we don't want to see this happen again. Um, and how can we do? How can we find that? I think it needs to be doing that role. Okay, here we are uh, on the first of November, twenty twenty four. The NACC has acknowledged the mistake in judgment, as we've already discussed, and has undertaken to uh, appoint what they call an eminent person, a, po a person appointed by Commissioner Brereton and his fellow commissioners. Uh, at their own independent discretion. Uh, will that be sufficient to allay public concern, particularly if this eminent person doesn't uh, disagrees with Margaret and Michael and you, Will, and finds that the NACC's original decision was justified? Uh, this is the awful mess and dilemma of this, uh, uh, of this tragedy, that the Australian Perfect, uh, Public Service Commission had already handled the disciplinary uh, fallout from this and no further action was required. So uh, who, who's going to be the eminent person? I know it's speculation because we don't know. Uh, any ideas? Uh, Michael? Absolutely no idea. The word <laughs> eminent didn't appear in the inspector's uh, um, requirements, just a, just a person. Uh, but no doubt uh, uh, somebody who's appropriate to the task. I mean, one of the difficulties... Uh, Quentin, it's worth mentioning there are you can have up to three deputy uh, commissioners. They've appointed three already, and I would have thought they none of neither of them could actually take the job on because uh, they're hopelessly compromised when you have regard to all the facts. So there's no extra um, deputy commissioner who can be asked to do the job as was initially done. The, the deputy commissioner was given the job. 
So the idea is that, that under section 41, subsection 5 of the of the NAC Act, which says the commissioner may at any time reconsider whether or how to deal with the corruption issue. Um, and it's suggested that 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 under that provision, you can effectively, by the sound of it, I don't quite get it, delegate the commissioner's job on the reconsideration to the so-called eminent person. I'm puzzled by it. I'd love to know what the thinking behind it is, but I don't see how Section 41.5 enables someone to stand in the shoes of the commissioner to do the job. And if the commissioner is really just going to exercise um, judgment under that provision to ask the so-called eminent person to give them a report along the lines of Alan Robertson's report, but looking at the facts, the yeah. merits of the case, then it's the commissioner who'd have to make the decision all over again. We already know what the commissioner's thoughts were because he uh, basically at the 19th of uh, October told his colleagues what the key issues were. So I, I, I think there are some other problems here, but I might be missing something. Some of the Commonwealth Attorney Generals can perhaps point to another provision. Well, the, the Attorney General can't uh, help us here. This is an independent agency set up by the Parliament of Australia. Margaret, uh, uh, can you give us some uh, names for the eminent person who's prepared to take on this task? Uh, I, I value my life, thank you, uh, <laughs> uh, Quentin. I wouldn't be prepared to do that. But, but uh, I agree with Michael. I've had a look at it too. It does seem to be a very strange source of power uh, that section 41.5 to do what what the statement is suggesting uh, can be done. There is a provision for the uh, Governor General to appoint an acting commissioner uh, if the commissioner is unable to perform the duties of office for whatever reason. Now, that's a pretty broad power. It would suggest that perhaps uh, the commissioner has to stand aside for this particular matter, but Oh, that's messy, and I don't don't think that's what they've got in mind at all. The CEO can appoint uh, external consultants on behalf of the Commonwealth. Maybe that might be the way to look at a source of power, but who would want to take it on now? Well, maybe they put an ad in the paper. Uh, look, uh, look. Sorry to cut to uh, the chase here. I know I can tell you that the robo debt victims, as uh, they're called, will not be appeased or will not pipe down in the political uh, debate in Australia if the eminent person validates the NACC decision not to further investigate. That means uh, validates the NACC commissioner's decision, Commissioner Rose's decision. Will you agree with that? Uh, do you agree with that uh, political analysis? Will? You're asking, you're asking me? Um... Yeah. To the extent to which I understand the, the, the views of the of those who were affected adversely by this, I mean, I, it sounds right to me. Um, you know, it whoever is this eminent independent person will be under tremendous political pressure uh, to to reverse course. I think on this decision, um, and you know, and as I, I share the concerns about exactly where the where actually the power comes from, and ultimately legally, I think that even if Brereton, the commissioner delegates this to someone else, it ultimately will be his reconsideration decision, right? Uh, legally. Anyway, so it, it, it just raises, it raises even more questions of, I think, what a lot of people are rightly concerned about, which is some of the transparency issues around the way this, the, the procedures are working internally. And maybe they're working it out now and they're going to give us a clear understanding of what's happening, but it's time. I think it is at this stage, it's in the near future, in the next weeks, we need to know what power, who is this individual? How are they being appointed? How are they going to be, how are we ensuring that they're both, that they're independent at least of the commissioner? Um, Cause that's obviously very critical given what's just happened. And then going from there, what, what, what's next? So yeah, it's, it's, it's obviously a very, you know, difficult situation, but maybe, you know, I think maybe an opportunity for NAC to, to, start to rebuild its reputation. Well, all those people who supported the establishment of the National Anti-Corruption Commission in federally after years of uh, campaigning, I know are, are distressed uh, about this. Uh, Margaret, uh, I'll start with you first. Uh, should Paul Brereton resign? Should? 
I, I'm not actually prepared to say that he should resign, but I think that let me let me I ask you this, this a... time, Irene. If you're struggling, if you're struggling, you go. Um, well, I was really going to say that the, it is deeply disappointing. I was one of those many who was campaigning for a national anti-corruption or integrity commission. And, of course, with I presume it was the deals that were done with the opposition to get bipartisan support. It was watered down and watered down. It, it was so important that this, this lived up to the hopes and expectation of people. It has been deeply disappointing. And um, I'm just not persuaded that the commissioner understands the role of the NAC. And he, uh, he certainly doesn't seem to understand that corrupt conduct of itself identified is an important part of its role. Uh, it's it's and so I would say that he has not been like Caesar's wife, and uh, that's as far as I'm prepared to go. All right, thank you, Margaret. I know it's difficult, uh, Michael. I'd be like Margaret. I I don't want to uh, express a particular view about what the commission should do. It's it's plainly very embarrassing when you are the head of a new important integrity agency like the NAC to uh, to, to suffer this uh, reverse from the uh, from the inspector uh, and on something that as Margaret said earlier the judges are well versed on um, it, it's up to the commissioner to decide I mean what everyone's worried about is that we don't want to see this important agency weakened as to its reputation let alone its its powers um, I have no doubt that a range of the issues that uh, the commissioner uh, told his colleagues back in in July and uh, or particularly in October last year were were relevant. Uh, it could be relevant to the uh, triage process as you uh, adverted to it, Quentin, but so might other points. And any person who was doing that job or comes to do that job will be asking, what are all the factors that are relevant? Um, it, it is very embarrassing to say the relief, to say the least, and I'm sure the commissioner's um, uh, thoughtfully uh, taken account of his situation. Well, uh, if uh, Brereton wants to tough it out, as we journalists would say, um, uh, there's no way he can be blasted out of there uh, under these uh, circumstances. He, he uh, uh, is the beneficiary of the independence under the uh, under the Act. So uh, let me ask you that hard question. Should he resign? Yes, I think he should resign. I think the reputation of the institution of this newly created anti-corruption commission rests heavily on the on leadership. And in this case, he's shown his leadership to be to be lacking. And if people are losing, if the public is losing trust in the National Anti-Corruption Commission, it won't be able to play its role as guardian of the public trust itself. So yeah. I think it's. I think he should resign his position. Yeah, that's the distressing aspect of uh, of all this. Um, the it is significant. I think that uh, Paul Burton has what a good old copper would say copped it sweet. He's admitted to a mistake in judgment after Furness and Robertson's uh, report. Uh, so we've got to wait in suspense for the NACC to announce the appointment of the eminent person uh, and everybody will make their judgments adverse or negative about the capacities of that person uh, to uh, review the robo.referral. Uh, referral. Um, the, the question then is um, uh, what now for the future? There's been some suggestion from the crossbench uh, that uh, we should be reviewing the NACC uh, legislation. Uh, is that a possibility? And in what regard would we would we review it? I mean, uh, we set up these agencies, but the key point is who gets the job? And uh, as you pointed out, if, if uh, Paul Brereton has made a fundamental errors in the actual role of anti-corruption um, uh, in this in this body, uh, we've got a big problem. Can it be fixed by any legislative reform? Uh, Michael? Well, 
just before I go to that very particular last question, I think it also remains open to question uh, the so-called eminent person, um, what the basis of that appointment will be, what statutory basis uh, will there be to their appointment? And I think that's going to be a, a real question. If it is under Section 41.5, there might be people who would question that. It might become a legal question that goes to the courts. I, I haven't had a lot of time at all to look at that question, but when I look at the provision that's been relied upon in the inspector's report, as I said earlier, I'm a little bit mystified in its terms. It doesn't seem to enable a delegation. What would be the point? The Commission already has the power to delegate to to, to one of the three deputy commissioners. But the, the, the problem for the future, uh, look, bodies like the Centre for Public Integrity uh, and other bodies uh, will, and the Parliament itself, will be wanting to see, after an appropriate period of time, just how the NAC is proceeding, what teething problems there might be. Uh, over time, you know, like with all sorts of other accountability agencies, the question of their funding will be important. But the runs on the board will also be important. This yeah, this is a this is a bad hiccup. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, I'm not sure that there's any immediate legislative change that you'd make to the act to to obviate the problem that's been exposed. Yeah. Because that's... I mean, we're all we're all uh, upset that uh, on the public interest uh, on the public hearings aspect of it, which is which we oh, put right. an educative uh, focus as well as an accountability focus, which would well, build that was, trust. That was which... something that uh, the Centre for Public Integrity and I met with the crossbenchers amongst other people, uh, just as the legislation was going through, and we met with the uh, the attorney attorney, and we pushed hard. To enable public hearings. Well, I, I think it's, it's it's well understood that Albo did a deal with uh, Dutch. <laughs> uh, the Prime Minister did a deal with the leader of the opposition, uh, wanting to get bipartisanship in getting the legislation through. And the the compromise between the Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition was that uh, it, it, we're not going to put it at risk of being a a Russian show trial or or, or a show trial uh, to embarrass people. Uh, uh, for public sport, uh, we're going to we're going to limit the powers of public hearings. And uh, but the other point, Will, is that uh, Paul Brereton was uh, Mark, Mark Dreyfus's pick. He he, he picked uh, Brereton. He put the num the uh, his name to the cabinet and to executive council, the governor general, and uh, and the cabinet. And uh, uh, he was willing to uh, step up. Um, it's Dreyfus's. If Dreyfus has made a, a misjudgment, what's the political fallout for him? Well, I don't know about the political fallout. Let me just step back and think about there might be something. One of the things we've been thinking about at the Centre Public Integrity in, in our work on anti corruption commissions is how to get leadership appointments working better. And of course, part of that is just norms and you can't actually legislate. But one thing that would have, I think, potentially helped this situation or could have helped this situation with the appointment is to not purely make the decision the in the in the gift of the of the minister responsible but also to involve the parliamentary committee that itself oversees the NAC right in that decision making process and that's a that's a model we see in other parts of Australia where oversight committees in parliament themselves play a role in in vetting candidates thinking about candidates and maybe they could have caught it early and said look I, I think this individual that you've proposed just doesn't seem to really understand the role that, you know, yeah. so yeah, that could point. be a way I mean, to fix the leadership issue or try point. to work on this leadership issue. And the attorney could say any red flags about uh, about this. I'm thinking about nominating this person. Yeah. That's uh, right. Let's look at the CV. People know him. It's a small town, Australia. <laughs> yeah, people know yeah. him. Have a, you know, have some have some informal chats with key members of that committee. Obviously, there are members of that committee who the CPI worked with very closely in, in actually drafting the David Shrewbridge as being one example of people and, and get those get them involved in, in at least thinking they don't have a veto power necessarily. But we think about them being involved. It's, in being it's a to... red flag thing that you could yeah. get. We're, we're not going the American system. We've got the old British system here of uh, uh, the attorney consults the chief justice and the yeah. Bar Association and all the other stakeholders. Margaret, can you see a way where... Uh, we can get uh, uh, people who will not make these sorts of mistakes in judgment. It's very much the character test, isn't it? 
Uh, and I think the, the points that were made by Will are, are, are well made. Uh, you actually do have to make soundings about people. And uh, I think some things might have been said in this particular case. Could, could I could I just uh, take make this point for the future for this particular issue? One of the, the uh, objections, of course, was, look, it's all been done in the Royal Commission and uh, there's no need to sort of put everyone through the mill again, et cetera, et cetera. Well, uh, the fact of the matter is one of the reasons for not holding public hearings was reputational loss and damage yeah. and so on. It's already happened to these people. They've been excoriated both in the report and, of course, we all, all saw what happened. So this is a very good, I think, should should the decision be made to, to actually investigate this one, to have public hearings, because I think that these are absolutely in the public interest and they're exceptional circumstances. And if these enormous number of public servants who behave uh, unethically, you know, I'll just use that fairly neutral term, if this isn't an extraordinary circumstance, then what in heaven's name would be? And what does it say about our country that we have to hold those sort of hearings in secret? And we've already had the Royal Commission that's already exposed them. So so uh, I, th I think that there would be a good call, even though, like everyone else, I work to have public hearings. <laughs> it didn't happen. Yeah. Listen, uh, the NACC every week puts out its uh, report uh, showing the number of complaints, the ones that have uh, got through tri triage, as they call it, and uh, those that have, which have resulted in uh, convictions for uh, down table uh, uh, public officials. Uh, is that um, uh, is that uh, sufficient uh, transparency for their uh, their activities? Given that there's a very high threshold of uh, serious and systemic uh, corruption before they apply uh, the public hearing uh, methodology to uh, expose, uh, Michael. I haven't looked at uh, the level of disclosure in in that regard, Quentin. Uh, it's it's good that the disclosure is made. Uh, I would have thought there'd be various ways perhaps to uh, to obtain further information. Uh, I'm, a, like Mark, a long-standing critic on putting brakes on the public uh, hearing power. Um, I, think, I think that very issue that you're talking about, the extent to which um, there's a degree of publicity that follows an inquiry or report, particularly where there are issues that have been upheld, uh, and the extent to which the public hearing power is is exercised. We've seen what's happened in Victoria, which has the similar sort of break uh, on the public hearing power. It goes right back when we when we brought the well, the commissioners in WIM brought out the recommendation to set up a corruption commission here. You had people who are often proxies for the politicians, but then the politicians themselves say, oh, this is just a star chamber, as you said, the Russian show trial. And there's a very strong anti-hearing, indeed, in many respects, anti-corruption commission sentiment amongst politicians. Uh, so that's that's always, always a play. Will, uh, there are other, uh, you, you want to answer that? I, I've got another question. We've only got a couple of minutes left, people, uh, about uh, Paladin. There are other things on that concern me as a journalist on, on this accountability issue. Uh, uh, and, and we don't get a an insight into uh, their, uh, the NACC's uh, triage uh, explanations uh, that we need more uh, to build trust in this uh, in this body. Uh, but uh, Will, you wanted to say something? Just on the weekly updates, um, and it goes to a point we've made. If you read the weekly updates, which I which I do, uh, you know they're all about how many convictions they've had. Um, it's almost like a kind of numbers game. They've had this many referrals, and they're. Um, it's so you know, it does, again, suggest the, the way in which the leadership under Commissioner Barrington uh, misunderstands the role of this institution as, as largely about getting convictions, running convictions up on the board as if they're just a souped up crime commission, rather than actually telling us, OK, we're engaged in a systemic you know, report that we're going to be looking at and making recommendations about how to avoid you know, so again, I think the, the, these reports are a really good um, kind of evidence as well about the, the misunderstanding of the role of this institution that's fed into all of the concerns around why they haven't been looking at robo debt. Because um, yeah. it seems that they want to run up convictions at this stage. And, and I just don't think that that's what 
the public expects them, and certainly not the tradition of integrity oversight that, that Australia has built up for over 30 years. And, and, and the other uh, disconnection, if I can call it that, was uh, in one of his speeches, Paul Burton seemed to characterise the NACC as like an intelligence agency, using the information which was coming in from informants, and honestly, in some cases, non-disclosed identities in some cases, but factual uh, complaints about what was perceived by the complainants as uh, corruption, uh, he seemed to characterise it as an intelligence agency. Uh, did you pick that up, Margaret? I, I think so. And, of course, that goes back to the, the earlier question about uh, um, what, what a wider group might have had to say about the, the particular choice, because that there's a big background here. Uh, and it may very well in influence his focus on the uh, on the NAWC um, in in this particular way. So, uh, well, how could Dreyfus, if that was if that was a shared view, how could Dreyfus make the mistake in giving it to Paul Brewer and giving this gig to Paul Brewer? Uh, we, you can't answer that. Uh, we need to interview the Attorney General to get to an answer to that. Any any observations? about uh, Paul Brereton's CV. I mean, he's well regarded by uh, many journalists in Australia because of uh, the uh, the war crimes investigations, uh, which were in camera, of course. Uh, and we only the public only found out about it because of the defamation, one of the biggest defamation cases in the history of our country. Um, uh, any observations, Will? Oh, just, I can just say one thing that I think a lot of his work, which is incredibly eminent, uh, he's an eminent individual himself, has been focused on criminal accountability. Um, and, you know, you wonder if, if that laser-like focus on criminal accountability has given him, has, has blinded him somewhat to the broader ambit and focus and, and you know, role that an anti-corruption commission in the Australian tradition should play. I just wonder if that's, that's part of what's going on. But certainly the work he's done has been very focused on this and has been very eminent on that. Michael, final remarks? I, not on Paul Bretton, I don't desire to, to comment on that, but I have absolutely no doubt from other experiences I've had just to run the State Administrative Tribunal in Western Australia, when you have a setback like this, I have no doubt that the Commissioner, the Deputy Commissioners and senior people will be asking themselves how they're going to deal with this sort of issue next time it happens, because when you've got you know, senior people who occupy those positions, the conflict issue is going to arise again. You're at the Commonwealth level. People know people, whether or not they met them and had a copy with them in the Chairman's Lounge, Quentin. Uh, <laughs> you have to sit down and, and work through some of the questions you've asked today. How can we better improve uh, our systems within the Commission itself? Margaret, are you a member of the Chairman's Lounge? I'm not a member and I never have been, Quentin. Now, before... Before mean people say, well, of course, you've never been invited. <laughs> That's not the case. You resent not being invited? <laughs> no, no, it's not that I wasn't Sorry. invited. No. Final, no. final. This is very serious because we're, everybody's equally distressed uh, who uh, support the Centre for Public Integrity that uh, the big breakthrough in getting the National Anti-Corruption Commission has uh, uh, seemed to have uh, uh, fallen at the first hurdle. Margaret, uh, some final remarks. Well, if I weren't so old, I think I would weep, um, but it's not good for the makeup. And it is very distressing. I hope, like Michael, there's some re regrouping and rethinking about it. The CVs of all of the appointees, the deputy commissioners and the commission, as well as the commissioner that's already been mentioned by Will, are outstanding. But in the end, in the end, I think it's more than that. You need to have the capacity to see your larger role. You have to have some life's experience about these things and know how it all works. I think their lack of curiosity, uh, which came through in the Operation Bannister report for Paladin, fills me with dismay, as well as their very strange approach to this one. And right. so I hope, I hope for the future that they will, but, you know, I'm not really that confident that it will happen. Okay, uh, thanks. For that uh, final quick remark, Will. We're at the hour. I, I just I, very quickly. I think hopefully this is an. I mean, it's certainly a crisis for the commission, but it's also potentially an opportunity for them to 
to change to change course, whether it's under Commissioner Brereton's leadership or someone else's. But it's time, you know, for them to learn and to learn and learn into this role and play this role that that anti-corruption commissions have played in Australia for decades. Something that all right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we await uh, to see whether Paul Brereton resigns. Uh, that's uh, still in play. We wait for the eminent person to see whether uh, where that goes. Thanks, everybody, for participating from the Centre for Public Integrity. See you next time.